What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Tuesday, March 19th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, climate bureaucrats giving China a free pass on its massive pollution. I think the cover art does this one all the justice it needs. Next up, a little Sarah Week action for everybody. Saudi Aramco CEO says energy transition is failing. The world should, quote, abandon the fantasy of phasing out oil. Harsh words from the Aramco CEO at Sarah Week down in Houston. Next up, Ukraine won't extend Russian gas transit deal, according to official sources out of both countries. Finally, Germany signs long-term LNG supply deal with Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas climate. Uh, finance market and specifically cover a nice article put out by the Wall Street Journal today talking about private equity, specifically cashing out um, on all things oil and gas. As always, guys, I'm Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Let's go ahead and kick it off, Stu. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start out with our buddies over there in China. Climate bureaucrats giving China a free pass on massive uh, pollution. Miss producer, if you don't mind, you got to sh- you got to show this to our folks. There is absolutely smog galore. You can't see. You can't see anything and they're still wearing a mask. Uh, I guess nope. it's COVID, but Here's where I, I, I think it's absolutely funny that we're buying so much crap from uh, China um, that it is actually disgusting because they're making all of the stuff using coal and killing people. So um, I love this one uh, section in here. The readiness of taxpayer funded bureaucrats to cast off the basic principles of justice and common sense should be cause for concern. Really? While socialist regimes regimes have long embraced collective guilt and group punishment and div- individual responsibility is fundamental to the American tradition. We're getting browbeat for not being green enough, and we have reduced our carbon emissions by 22%. China has increased by 2220%. I just find this despicable. Yeah, it's it's pretty unbelievable. I mean, anybody who's been paying attention or has watched the show in the past year or is a reader of Energy Newsbeat knows that China is is talking with one hand over here but doing another thing over here and it's, you know, it's exactly it's the shell game with emissions. They're 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 buying cheap oil from everywhere storing it selling it cross markets while burning coal at home so again that's the issue and, china and, and there's even lng 2.61 emissions times larger than what we're doing emissions in the united states unbelievable oh yeah and and we go in our in uh energy costs are going through the roof and energy poverty is real in the u.s and we're having to shut down everything because of the smog in china uh what was the old saying you better eat all your food on your plate because there's starving kids in china how about don't breathe because there's people in in china that need to breathe (laughs) hold hold your breath on this one Hold your breath. Let's, let's go to our buddies over there in Saudi Arabia. That was funny. I don't care who you are. It's a good one. Sa- Saudi Aramco CEO says energy transition is failing and world should abandon the fantasy of phasing out oil. Uh, this one is pretty cool. Uh, uh, Armin Nasir said uh, that energy transition is failing. The real world, here's a quote In the real world, the current transition strategy is visibly falling on most fronts as it collides with five hard realities um the they are uh urgently needed let's see what they are 
Yeah, I, I was. I watched this interview because it was on CNBC. He oh, says sweet. that there's these five hard realities, but didn't really go on and explain what they were. The, yeah. the next quote that he's got is a transition strategy reset is urgently needed. And my proposal yes. is this. We should abandon the fantasy of phasing out oil and gas and instead invest them in adequately or invest them adequately reflecting realistic demand assumptions. Oh, that's a shot across to the IEA. Oh, absolutely. In the, in Paris, they said that, oh, shoot, uh, peak oil and gas and coal would come in 2030. Nasser said demand is unlikely to peak any time soon. Okay, we know that uh, Janet Yellen is saying that inflation is transitory. I'd like to say that we've got a new one now. Nasser is saying natural gas is not transitory. So he has a better haircut than Janet Yellen. Oh yeah. <laughs> hey, at least he's got at least they both got hair compared to what you're working oh, with over there. Smoke them if you got them. That was a great but, one. But no, this really I was watching this live on CNBC. This was a shot across at the IEA. And he specifically says that. He goes, he goes on to suggest that the IEA is focusing on demand in the US and Europe and needs to refocus on the developing world as well. Who would have thought the IEA only cares about the countries that give it money? Who would have thought? Yeah. Uh, who would have thought that they've been criminally uh, accepting money? I'm going to call them criminals. We'll just go on to the next <laughs> one here. Uh, Ukraine won't extend Russian gas transit deal. This is official from both sides. Uh, Michael, let uh, Miss Producer, if you can call up the the picture of what's called the land bridge in Ukraine, there's a little more to this story in another story. It's a blue, red, and this is really Ukraine, and you can see where Crimea, Crimea is down there. And I called it uh, when the war started, Michael. I said this war will be over when he gets his land bridge now. Uh, so when you take a look at this, uh, he can confirm this is Galostenko, Chenko. I can confirm we have no plans to enter into any additional agreements or extend this current agreement. Listen to these stats under the agreement signed in 2019, Gazprom agreed to transit 65 billion cubic meters of gas through Ukraine in 2020 and 40 billion cubic meters between 2021 and 2024. Wow. Here's my prediction. I'm going on record. And that is uh, two months into the war, Biden stopped them from signing a deal. Uh, the warmongers got involved two months. And so uh, Tucker uh, basically brought out an awful lot. And I don't think Ukraine war can continue. So that all the information that came out, Ukraine and Russia are now talking again. And I think that very soon it's going to be okay again to buy Russian natural gas because of the deindustrialization of Germany is killing the economy. And you're seeing a lot more conservative governments coming around the corner. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was it was clearly it was clear that Kiev wasn't going to continue this. Con I mean, if, if if I didn't have that on my I don't that wasn't on my bingo card or that <laughs> was on my bingo card list of Ukraine not going to do business in Russia. So I didn't necessarily take this that find this too crazy. What this will do is in 20, 30 years, this will damage them because now they're cutting off an access to cheap, low cost energy where. If in 30 years, I mean, in 30 years, they could be friends. Who knows what happens? I can't tell you what's going to happen in the region tomorrow yet, let alone in 30 years. By doing this and not uh, not locking this in, it's only going to make Ukrainian energy more expensive down the road because they're going to have to source it from somewhere and, else. And looking at a map, Michael, it's not just Ukraine that we're talking about. It's everything from Ukraine yep. all the way to the yep. Strait of the Gibraltar through uh, France, through, I mean, through down through Spain and everything else, because that pipeline fans out like you wouldn't believe. So anyway, yeah. this this has an, a, a total impact to the EU. Yeah. Um, so anyway, OK, let's go to Germany. This goes to where they're trying to put a Band-Aid uh, on this whale. 
Uh, Band-aids don't really stick in the ocean, by the way. Have you ever been bitten by something and tried to put a Band-aid on? It doesn't stay on. Germany signs an LNG supply deal with Agna. Um, and so you, they signed a 15-year deal uh, with S, uh, EFE for the delivery of, Michael, 1 million metric tons per annum. Yep, and this that. is coming out of the Abu Dhabi's new uh, Ruales LNG project, which they're currently under construction right now. So they're already pre-selling LNG that's coming out of their new constructions. Love this. Uh, I bet they're permitting it gets them on time and under budget. Now, what I do want to know is this Ruales LNG project is, quote-unquote, expected to be the first LNG export facility in the Middle East and North America Re, or North Africa region, excuse me, to run on, quote, clean power. What do they mean by clean power? Nuclear. Who knows? Probably natural gas? Nuclear. Oh, this is going to run on nuclear? This is going to run on nuclear. Oh, where do you know that? How, does that? It doesn't say that here in the article. It doesn't, but I know the area. Ah, so you think this is going to run on nuclear in, power? In du right across the border in Dubai is where they have the brand new four nuclear reactors that have come online. So the answer is nuclear. Absolutely. Um, they've also got a natural gas delivery deal with Equinor lined up um, for an estimated $55 billion total net worth. So they're they're cranking it out over there. Oh, and we've got uh, Biden over here going, no LNG for you, even though we have promised it. Well, <laughs> it's, 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 it's unbelievable. So if uh, Seinfeld soup Nazi, you know, if you sit back and kind of go, Biden doing an imitation of Seinfeld. <laughs> it's what it's come to, unfortunately. It is. Off to you, dude. All right, well, we'll go ahead and kick it over to finance. But before we do that, guys, we'll go ahead and pay the bills. As always, check us out. World's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. The best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and oil and gas business. Hit the description below for all the links to the articles, all of the timestamps so you can jump back, hear about Saudi Aramco and what they said at Sierra Week, but also you can jump ahead and, and hear about one of the stories I'm going to cover, which is all the PE firms making a boatload of money in the oil and gas business right now. Um, you can also check out dashboard.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy um, and data news combo. That's a nice little MVP we have. We're, it's going behind some sort of paywall at some point, folks. So please we really on. enjoy the feedback that we've gotten on that and, and are looking forward to bumping that up. We've also got some, some cool stuff that we're considering working on. So I'd recommend in the description below, take that survey. We'd really appreciate it. Get you signed up um, for our latest um, uh, free trial of, 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 of our uh, potential new subscription that we're going to be rolling out here soon. So again, appreciate everybody. www.energynewsbeat.com. You know, when we look at how the markets did today, Stu, S&P 500 up about six-tenths of a percentage point, NASDAQ up a full percentage point, um, ten -year, or two-year yields and 10-year yields basically flat about 0.04 percentage points and 0.09 percentage points, so 10-year out tracking the two-year barely, a uh, dollar index a 0.14 percentage point. Bitcoin down a little bit, 67,000 um, off of its peak of around 73 earlier in the weekend. Crude oil had itself a, a great day today. Brent, uh, WTI up 1.38 percentage points, 82.16. Brent oil only up about half a percentage point, but finishing above $86 at 86.94. And we saw 87 today on that Brent side. Main reason for that is a couple things. So Iraq and Saudi Arabia came out today and officially said that they're going to be lowering export volumes. Iraq, which is the second largest OPEC producer, said it's going to go ahead and reduce crude exports to 3.3 million barrels per day in the coming months to compensate for exceeding the OPEC plus quota since January. <laughs> that play. So you, I want to ask you a question. So this would, quote unquote, cut shipments by 130,000 barrels of oil today. The real question is, do you believe them, Stu? The market no, did. I, I don't believe them at all because they are. There's a whole new uh, another article I was reading this morning. Uh, old 20 year old tankers have gone on sale and they are 
32 million dollars a piece cheaper and they're being sucked up by iran by venezuela so the answer is no sources are telling me this is hogwash yeah absolutely i mean just i i, I would have assumed so um but really what so and then, then then what you're saying is what the market is really keying on is what saudi arabia exports their actual volumes correct. of crude exports have fallen for the second straight month down to 6.29 million um that's down from 6.3 million in december um we also did see some more ukrainian drone attacks and energy infrastructure which have shut down about seven percent of russian refining so you know we'll be definitely watching there um, even though Russia did also increase um, their exports by about 200,000 barrels to 2.15 million per day. I, you know, the only other thing I saw, Stu, is, I mean, we're, we're pretty quiet on the Western front um, from a uh, from an from an oil and gas standpoint. You know, Conoco Phillips and Devin are kind of the only two players out there on the on the deal front that haven't really done anything. So it'll be interesting to see when they decide to make a move, whether it's with each other. I'm not saying I've heard anything on that standpoint, but they're really two of the outstanding players. I thought what was interesting was Wall Street Journal today came out with an article, Stu, specialist buyout firms cash in on shale consolidation. Really nice overview that you can read on uh, on EMB right now, specifically covering some of you know kind of the top three private equity firms: NCAP, Capital Quantum Groups, and NGP uh, Energy Capital Management. The la the the last one being a Dallas based company where I'm at. Um, you know, in, in in the last year, they sold assets those three companies for an expected value of about thirty point five five billion dollars. Fueling Ooh. huge distributions to in investors, which is really a stark contrast from where the private equity space had been in the last, you know, sorry, two, three years. You know, to kind of walk through, for example, NCAP, you know, they distributed $7.8 billion to their investors Ooh. in 2023 for its oil and gas funds, mainly off the back um, of the sale of its uh, uh, West Texas company, Oventiv. They went ahead and, and, and drafted a... Uh, uh, and, and got Oventive to kind of peel off a lot of their Midland Basin stuff. We saw Quantum Capital Partners disperse about $3.1 billion, um, which was a little bit less than their $3.8 billion they did in 2022. That was mainly off the back of their sale of Rockcliffe Energy um, and their sale of its um, gas-producing asset in East Texas to Tokyo Gas. So majority of that going for you. Um, NGP Capital surpassed their record of $1.5 billion paid out in 2021 mainly from asset sales from a bunch of few smaller um, deals that they went ahead and, and, and made. They, they, they were behind a, a lot of the uh, – had a bunch of stuff in the Permian right now. Friend of the show, Andrew Dittmar, I thought he, he was quoted in this piece. I thought he did a good job, Stu, of saying, really, oil has been at this Goldilocks price range, that $75 to $85 a barrel. That's a comfortable point to transact for both buyers and sellers. Not a terribly robust statement, but I do think it – um, from Andrew Dittmar over there in Inveris. We love them. But I do think it highlights that this zone we're in right now makes it very easy to transact. You Buyers feel like they're getting there's some value to get in terms of free cash flow to cover any EBITDA margins. And sellers feel like they're getting good value relative to what they're getting. They're willing to maybe take equity in a stock. I mean, think about it. when oil prices are down, it's harder to take a stock deal because why would you do that? Stock's trending down. If prices are up and you feel like there's room for that stock price to grow you're more willing to transact specifically in stock but on the other hand you've also just got more cash available as a buyer so if you're interested in buying assets you've got more cash available you know obviously what what does this mean also private equity is going to be in the buying phase here soon so if there's ever a time to get your private equity funding now's the time because they're going to be looking they're going to be looking for an experienced management teams um, Dittmar went on to say, I think it's one of the more interesting conversations among private equity groups is how much of their drilling inventory do we convert to production and cash flow and how much do we leave for a buyer to develop? Very interesting comment because, you know, the old adage was drill, baby, drill, drill as many holes as you want, get that production up, sell off that production. Where now the question is of the, of, of the depleting inventory that we have in the United States. I've talked at nauseum about this. You know, we're not coming up with more tier one rock, folks. So it's all getting drilled up. It's eventually going to go away, specifically in the permit. So the question is, how much, how much, you know, how many bites of the apple do you leave the potential buyer down the road to get versus taking it all yourself, cash flowing the asset? The real question is, 
you know, how good are you at drilling? You know the old adage phrase, Stu, wouldn't want to screw up a good prospect by drilling it. Sometimes it's better to just buy the prospect and not drill it because then because then you can sell the dream to somebody else. It'll be interesting to see how that goes. You also have to remember these private equity companies tend to do a little bit less debt de- uh, debt heavy deals and do a little bit more equity, which can be bad when prices are low, but good when prices are high because it can fuel these distributions. These companies, I guarantee, are out raising money from institutional investors like gangbusters right now. So expect to see these funds get extremely big. But, you know, what do, what, what do you think about this, Stu? Private equity is going crazy right now. Oh, I think it's fabulous. Um, now, I, I still disagree with you uh, on the tier one versus tier two because of the new technology that's come around the corner. Some of the tier two has actually stepped up a bit. And, and so I still, why are we producing more with less rigs? Well, we're not, um, we are. Well, okay. Uh, the, 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 remember we're six months behind. Get, get, let's talk about declining production, specifically in the Permian in six months. But yes, I tend to agree with you is that technology will get better. We'll become more efficient at creating the next, you know, the next dollar. I think you also have to remember oil and gas production overall is climbing because of our, I mean, we, we didn't cover this today, but there's a new gas dis- or there's a new oil discovery in Guyana that Exxon talked about today at there's at Sarah week. I watched the interview um, over there with Darren. Not, I think it's, not Dar- yeah, Darren Woods, he's the CEO yep. over there at Exxon Mobil. He was specifically talking about how they, you know, I, I don't have the article in front of me. You can find it on Newsbeat, but they're hoping to ramp that thing up to 600,000 barrels a day this year. And by 2026 or 2027, see that being 1.2 million barrels. So that's where the growth is coming. It's not coming from U.S. onshore. Yes, U.S. onshore will become more capital efficient. It'll over time, we'll see a reversion to where we will begin to drill a lot more economic wells. But the growth and why oil production is growing has nothing to do with U.S. onshore. It has everything to do with what's going offshore. That's where we'll disagree a little bit. Okay. So yes, rigs are going down and production is going up, not because U.S. onshore is becoming more efficient. It's because the majority of these rigs that are getting picked up is offshore. I mean, that's what you're going to see finally. I mean, I didn't. There's another story you can check on Newsbeat. We didn't talk about this. There's over $30 billion of final investment decisions waiting out there to be approved this year. Most of that being offshore. And with prices at $86 for Brent, you're going to see a lot of those get approved. So there's where the growth is. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, You got anything else? (laughs) No, we just have a lot going on. We're keeping an eye on Sarah week and uh, there's just a lot of things coming around the corner, dude. We have uh, today is Tuesday when this is airing. And on Wednesday, we have Doomberg and Chris Wright rolling out. Absolutely. Your 200th uh, interview. Isn't that pretty cool? It is. We we didn't even attempt to line that up. It just happened. And I saw I, that this week and I was like, oh, that's perfect. Uh, oh, it was pretty wild. Uh, and what two great guests to celebrate our number 200. Now, we did over 500 between me and you uh, last year. So, I mean, we hit 500. Uh, well, yeah, we're over 500 for the for for the Total Energy Newsbeat podcast, specifically with your your conversations. That's awesome. Check that out again, guys. Energynewsbeat.com. We'll go ahead and let you guys get out of here, though. We appreciate you checking us out here on this gorgeous Tuesday, March 19th. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.